this whole idea of how habits are formed can make sense. Because now what I want us to do is I want us to look at one of the most important <coughs> habits that Christ gave his life for. This one is important. This one is essential. So we're going to talk about the prayer loop. And just as we've broken down habits in the prior session, uh, all those cues, I'm sorry, all those cues are ones that uh, we all deal with in our day-to-day -day life, right? Mm -hmm. We have times of the day that are harder than others. We have certain people that maybe are more difficult than others. We have all these different types of cues, all kinds of cues. And yet God wanted to give us a routine that would lead us to a true reward. And that's what we're going to look at right now. So it's interesting that um, this happened. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Now what I find interesting about this is that, um, first of all, Jesus made really good disciples, right? And you can see that here, because these disciples wanted to learn something. And it's interesting that they're the ones asking for this, right? It wasn't Jesus like, okay, boys, gather up. I want to teach you guys how to pray. It was actually, I think, disciples noticed something about Jesus' life. They noticed that, man, this guy, he, he's got peace, but he's got drive. He's got kindness, but he's got strength. He's just got this perfect balance. And he was this perfect man. But this perfect man also needed something regularly. And that was prayer. So, before we talk about this a little bit more in detail, I want to just let you know about why prayer is really good for you. And this is just from you know, research of that over the last probably 10 to 12 years as they've been able to kind of fine point you know, exactly what is going on neurologically when people practice <clears throat> prayer. I know, I know. Guys, I'm really sorry. This is the best acronym I could come up with. So, try to think about this as a, as a loving smack of your brain when you pray, okay? But think about it. You're going to remember it now, aren't you? Right? Okay. Sorry it's a little violent, but uh, anyway. So, it reduces your stress. So they've actually been able to see that the production of cortisol in your brain actually goes down when you are in a praying state. Cortisol is a stress hormone. Uh, memory is improved. You're actually able to recall things better. I think both short and long-term memories. You are more attentive, more alert. You have improved cognitive functioning. In other words, you're probably able to like solve more complicated tasks or maybe uh, endure complicated tasks longer because of the improvement in cognitive thinking. And here's the goodie. It can keep your brain young. Yay. Oh, wow. All right? Now, think about that one. Now, if you tend to live with a lot of stress and you do not deal with that stress, if they look at your brain, this is what doctors or neuroscientists will say, is they'll look at your brain scan and they will actually look at your brain and say, wow, <clears throat> That looks like a very prematurely aged brain. Or if you use substances in any sort of regularity, right? If you, if you put toxins in your brain, like drugs or alcohol or smoking, that kind of thing, what you're doing is you are prematurely aging your brain. So, you may be 30 on the outside, but your brain is already functioning, looking like a 40-year-old brain. Now, believe me, there's nothing wrong with 40-year-old brains, right? <laughs> I got one, all right? But the point is, if you're 40, 
you'd really want to do some things that help you have like a 30-year-old brain, right? Because the younger your brain is, obviously that's, that's a good thing. So we, I'm just saying all this to make sure we understand the importance of taking care of our brains, right? How we live affects the quality of our brain. So it's interesting that um, when Jesus answered this question or starts to explain prayer, I like how he teaches how not to do it and then gets into how to do it, right? Now let's look at how he teaches this. It's very interesting, especially when you understand the whole idea of habits. He says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth. They have received what? Their reward in full. So if we break this down, the routine that Jesus is confronting here is praying to be seen by men. So I don't know what the issue was. I don't know what the cue was. Maybe they felt insecure. Maybe they didn't feel significant in some way. But whatever the cue was, they were using this routine to get their reward. So there's the question. When I pray, am I looking for my reward? Or do I want the reward that God wants to give me? Because if I pray to only get the rewards that I think of and that I want, I might get disappointed. In fact, I might not even have the right <laughs> prayer routine. <laughs> But it's interesting how Jesus here, I mean, he's confronting people that pray. But isn't that interesting? He's like, guys, sorry, you can even do that wrong. Because you've got to make sure you understand your cue. And you've got to really think, what is the reward you're looking for? And when you pray, go into your room. Close the door and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. See, isn't that interesting? The people that babbled, Jesus said, well, you got the reward that you wanted. But when you do it my way, you'll get the reward that God wants you to have. And guess what? God knows much better than me how to take care of me. So I should just probably accept that and work with that. And when you pray, oh boy, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So the routine, he, the routine here that Jesus points out is babbling prayer. Has anyone ever prayed with someone who babbles? Yeah. Spouses, don't look. <laughs> Just look at me. <laughs> look, we all do it, okay? I'm sorry. But Jesus is saying it's not a good routine. It's not going to work. And again, I don't know what the cues were, but maybe they just didn't feel heard or listened to or something. But that babbling prayer got them something that they wanted. Maybe they felt heard, righteous. What was the other one? Satisfied. Satisfied. Oh, I prayed for 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Why did you pray for 45 minutes? I mean, you've you got to look into it a little bit, right? Let's dig in here. So, here we go. So this then is how you should pray. Now, by the way, I want to back up to what he said a second ago. I'm sorry, to be skipping around here like this. But this is a really... Notice this last verse. I know. I don't know about you, but I, I think we've had a problem with this one verse for a while. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Now, some people have read that verse and go, Oh, so I don't really need to pray that much. I mean, come on. It says right there, God knows... What I need. So, you know, I'm, I've got it easy, right? <laughs> but God wants you to pray. God wants you to ask Him. Mm. Not to benefit Him. 
He wants you to ask because you asking can benefit you. That's right. It helps you to really think through what what what, what do I need? What 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 is important to me? And when you articulate that, right? Your brain is doing something very very important. Okay? Because it, obviously it helps you avoid that, that position of entitlement. You know? When you're entitled, you just kind of feel like things should happen. You know, when you, when you see an entitled kid, you know what they do? They stop asking. When you have an entitled spouse, they stop asking. Or they ask the wrong questions. Where is dinner? Right? That's a bad question, by the way. <laughs> See, I told you guys, 20 years, I've been doing it right, okay? I, well, I've made a lot of mistakes, but you get my point. This is just how it works. When you're entitled, you stop asking. And Jesus is saying, look, I want to help you to avoid ever getting anywhere close to entitled. So please, keep asking. Ask. Okay? Is that... Help? Yeah, All right. And we've already covered Babylon. Now, we get to the solution. This then is how you should pray. Now, as we break this prayer down, this is the Lord's Prayer that we're going to look at, I want us to be thinking about all the different benefits that Jesus is threading into this model of prayer. Now, believe me, I don't think there's any harm in actually saying the Lord's Prayer, but I also do believe it's a model. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't just want us to keep reading that thing, you know, for 2,000 years, and we'll be better, because that would contradict with some of the other things he's taught about prayer, right? So, as a model, I think we need to really pay attention to it. So, let's start with this. Our Father... Mm -hmm. What does that mean? When I use my brain and I use the word our, what part of my brain am I activating? Social. Our father. And I just I didn't figure this out until about a week ago. But I realized how rarely I ever pray our father. Now, I happen to live in a country that strongly believes in individualism. And you know what happens with individualism? I think about this individual a lot. And this individual becomes extremely important. And I end up talking a lot about this individual. And I end up praying a lot for this individual. And I want a lot of things for this individual. You see where this is going? This is not good, right? But it's interesting that Jesus taught our... Father. That means God is the Father of everybody. <laughs> He's the Father of people of that different race. He's the Father of those people that have that different culture. He, guess what? He's the Father of every single person at your job that you don't like. Wow. <laughs> Whoa! That is big! That's a big father, right? But we have to keep this in mind, right? Because if we lose that, we in our little world, in our little distorted thinking, we kind of start splitting the world up into yeah. all these little pieces and like, well, I like these people. Yeah. Well, mm, these people probably come to but guys, that, those two words are gigantic. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So remember earlier when we talked about where information goes? It goes up, right? Well, unfortunately, our thinking kind of goes up and then kind of stops at the prefrontal cortex, right? That's where we talked about all those 
you know, forethought and strategic thinking, all that crazy stuff goes on in our prefrontal cortex. But this prayer helps us go even higher. Right? Because David's will starts and stops right here in my prefrontal cortex. And that's all I can do. That's all I can figure out. But this prayer helps us go outside of us and fathom that, you know what? There is a will. There is a plan. There is an idea that is greater and beyond anything that I mm. could come up with, figure out, sort out, whatever. Does that make sense? Mm. So again, just this model of prayer is doing something phenomenal with how your brain is designed. And it's very, very helpful. All right, let's move on. Give us today our daily bread. Now, uh, you've probably studied this before on your own, but this whole word bread in the Greek, the word that Jesus used as he taught this, it didn't mean bread. <laughs> it meant just everything that you need. You're, you're just basic. Your, your daily needs, what you need to live from morning to night, all those basics, that's what I'm giving you. All of your needs. But unfortunately, because you live, I know we, we're probably in a whole range of socioeconomic levels here in this room, but unfortunately, all of us live in a very rich world. The poorest of us in this room right now is probably better than a majority of people that live on this planet. <coughs> but we do not fathom that. It's very difficult to fathom. So unfortunately, this is kind of our brain. <laughs> this is how our brain works, right? Yeah, I got my needs covered. But let's keep going. I want some stuff, right? I want this and I want that. Remember the monkeys? Grape juice, people. It doesn't work. Right? And so this is our brains, and yet Jesus is trying to help us. It says, give us our daily wants. No. 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 Give us our daily bread. In other words... Jesus is trying to give us a model of prayer where in my prayer life, I'm actually focused. I'm, I'm becoming aware of just needs that I have. And guess what? When I start noticing that and paying attention to that, I can actually be more grateful for that. And we already know, right, from earlier, the more thankful I am for things, I actually release good chemicals in my brain that help me be better. So this is the picture I think that he wants. If I can be so aware of all my needs, I imagine I will want less wants. Can you imagine that? I remember um, in 1992, a miracle happened in Moscow. You know what that miracle was? Peanut butter. <laughs> okay? Now, let me explain. From night I went to Russia the first time in 1988, and that was the first time in my first world brain <coughs> life I ever saw people in a line for food. In fact, in Russia, there were several lines. <laughs> you had a line for this food, which might be bread, and then there was a line over there, longer, for meat, and then there was a line over there for butter. I mean, it was crazy. My poor brain didn't have any wants. I didn't have any wants. It was like, Man, I need to eat somehow today. This is, how's this going to work, right? So I lived in this, and, I, and honestly, it was weird. I really loved it. It was because I think God showed me something. Like, David, this is what your brain is like when you're not surrounded with all these wants. And it actually felt awesome. It's true. It was hard, but at the same time, it was like, 
great. And man, when I got a piece of bread with cheese on it and some butter, oh man, I was a millionaire. It was awesome. But you know what? You probably had bread, cheese, and some butter on bread about an hour ago. Guess what? You didn't feel what I felt. You know? Because you know, I get that all the time. I always have food. But this is where Jesus is trying to help us people. He really is. Now, let me get back to the peanut butter. So, anyway, so I went back. I started living in Moscow in 91. Became a disciple in December. And still, you know, Russia was changing. I mean, it started to, it was like America just was haunting me and following me to, to Russia. Because all this westernization started coming in. I'll never forget the day the brother came in, this other American brother. was like, dude, at the Irish house, they have peanut butter. <laughs> what? Are you kidding? So, man, we booked it. We got to the Irish house. We bought this jar of peanut butter that none of us had eaten for about a year. And we're like, we open that puppy up and, oh, we spread that stuff good. And, oh, my goodness. This is awesome. I mean, we were crying, people. It was awesome. But do you understand? Yeah. You may have peanut butter in your home right now, but when you open that tonight, you're not going to sit there and go, oh, that's cool. Brits don't like peanut butter. So. <laughs> some, some can't relate to my, my weaknesses. But anyway, this is what I mean by when we get this prayer, when we get what Jesus is trying to do to our brains with this model of prayer, you will have, you will see, you will recognize, you will believe you have so many blessings in your life, but you can't see them when you're blinded by wants. And your brain is overfilled with wants. Okay. Oh, you thought we were done with that verse, but we're not. I'm so sorry. Here we go. Let's do it one more time. Give us what? Today. Today. Don't give me next week. Not not asking for last year. I'm not asking for, you know, a different family. Give us today our daily bread. Which goes back to what we talked about before. Jesus wants us living now. I can't live in last year. I can't even live in last week. And if I try... My brain will suffer for it. I can't live in next year. I can't live where I want to be in five years. But I can live now. Amen. And I will see a lot more in my life today when I live today. And I'm thankful for today. Amen. So we. Hey, man. Thank you. Well, she just gave me a little rush in my brain. Awesome. I love it. This is so good. All right. And now he is wrapping this model up, and now he's getting to a deeper relational part of the brain or of the prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So if you've been a Christian for more than maybe a day, someone has probably sinned against you. Right? How many here have had a Christian or a disciple sin against you? Again, don't don't look at them. <laughs> Keep your eyes on me. Man, you guys are going to get so much more out of this lesson than you thought. Anyway, okay. So anyway, <clears throat> but forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. When you do not forgive someone, your brain is locked into the past. And, by the way, when your brain is locked into a sin or an offense that someone else did to you, whether it was five minutes ago, or five years ago, or 50 years, it doesn't matter. That is additional 
strain on your brain. Okay? You cannot hold someone or hold a situation in your mind unforgiven and not be burdened. Mm. It is a burden. And that is why I believe this is included in a prayer, a model of prayer that also alluded to today. Right? He wants today to be perfect. Mm. But in order to get that, we have to forgive. Because when you forgive, you are liberating your own mind. When I moved to Russia, um, I moved there in August of 91. And at that time, I was not on speaking terms with my dad. I had not talked to him for about probably nine months. Became a disciple, obviously realized, okay, that's, that's got to change. But what was very interesting was that I learned that, you know, here I was on the other side of the globe, right? Okay, that's over there, that's Moscow. And over here is Oklahoma. And, you know, my dad, I mean, he's just going on about his life, doing things that he does and goes to work and spends time with people that he spends time with. And yet, I'm all the way over here, angry, hurt. How dare he? Yeah. But, but who was suffering? Was my dad suffering because I didn't forgive him? Maybe. Possibly. But one thing for sure, I was suffering by not forgiving him. You see? And yet, God wants me to be free. He wants me to be free. Right? And by freeing me, he gives me hope. And then guess what? He gives my dad hope. Because <laughs> I'm able to go back and go, oh, dad, I forgive you. And by the way, forgive me. You see? Just brain health. That's what it's all about. It's amazing. Okay. Let's keep going here. So, uh, we're looking at our cycle here. We have the cue. We're learning that in so many different aspects of life, right? All the things that we just broke down just from the Lord's Prayer, we can see so many cues that just the Lord's Prayer is such a great routine for. And the reward is peace. The reward is not more or something, some kind of stuff. It's a greater reward than that. It's peace. Which is an ideal state for our minds. I love this verse. Philippians 4 was just a real winner for me in 2014. This is amazing. Do not be anxious about anything... But in everything, <laughs> but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends my understanding. Okay, we have to interrupt that verse for a second. Let's not talk about all those people. Okay, it transcends my understanding. Look. How all those other people understand something is irrelevant. It's, it's how I understand things that gets in the way so much of the time. Yeah. It's how I understand what that person did and why they did it. That's my understanding that gets in the way. And I need something that can help transcend my own understanding of situations or circumstances in my life that I don't understand. And... This peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and what else? Minds. Your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus came here to take radical care of us. His teaching takes such good, thorough, from toe to head. It takes care of us if we really listen to it. So, let's break down the verse we just read. 
in the habit loop. All right. So apparently the Q is <laughs> everything. <laughs> the routine is what? Prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. And the reward is peace that guards your heart and mind. See? This is a habit that Jesus died to give you. He died to give us this connection with our Maker. Bad habits only go away with better habits. Now, if you look at this picture very carefully, there is a very bad habit in this picture. <laughs> Driving on the wrong side of the right road. Right there. Okay. You know what that bad habit's called? No. It's called the radio. radio. What? It's radio. called news. Oh. It's called loud music. All kinds of stuff. This was my bad habit. And when I was pra when I was studying 4A, we, when our church was going through this whole uh, series on the flip on Philippians 4 verse 8, we were looking at Philippians 4 6 and 7 that we just read about. Do not be anxious about anything, right? And I started to realize that I am a news junkie <laughs> or a news addict. Pick your word, I don't care. But the point was that was just my routine. That was my habit. I get in the car, turn it on. I'm a little bored, turn it on. You know, I mean, all these different cues, the routine was turn on the radio. And for me, I wasn't really so much into music. I just really liked just listening to the news. Yeah. But have you noticed the news? Yeah. <laughs> Is your news like our news? Oh, yeah. I told London yesterday that you guys are actually part of the problem because I listen to uh, public radio and we get BBC radio news over there a lot. So it's half your fault. <laughs> so anyway, the point is, so, you know, news is just kind of my thing. And then I realized, so why am I praying and trying to get all this peace and, and do my prayer life all these different ways and better ways? Why do I do that? But at the same time, I keep putting stuff in that surely doesn't decrease my anxiety. And seriously, I have a major problem. If I can listen to news about beheadings on the other side of the planet, and I think that doesn't affect me, I am in serious denial. But for us to listen to that stuff and just go, oh, yeah, that's normal. That's normal. There is something fundamental going wrong with how we're taking care of this. So I made a radical decision. I said, okay, that's it. News, hmm. I'm not going to let the radio be the source of anxiety. I'm going to do something different. So I got some good ideas from some friends of mine. I found a couple of Christian radio stations. I even put one on classical music. Yeah. That one was hard. Because <laughs> classical music. Now, hey, I'm a musician. I love classical music. I'm a trombonist, a former trombonist. I love classical music, but man, there are just some moments where you need to speed it up again or get louder or something. But the point is, but even that I started realizing, isn't that interesting? That, you know, I'm sitting here listening to music, but, oh, no. I, I want something else. I, I want more. I want, I want louder. And I realized my brain was protesting. My brain was like, oh, no, 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 let's not calm down. Oh, no, 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 let's not slow down. You see, so I'm just warn. Let me warn you right now. Remember, bad habits are easy in the beginning yeah. and harder later on. Yeah. But great habits are hard at first, but they get better over time. I can count on one hand how many times I listen to the news in a week. By the way, that's improvement. Okay, it's a huge improvement. But I've got so much, much more going in. And, and as a result of that, I've discovered all kinds of things. I've listened to these Christian podcasts, uh, Christian musicians I've never heard of before. I'm like getting all these new sources of material that can go into my brain and actually help me, right? Rather than distract me or deter me from what should be the most important thing in my life, right? Mm -hmm. I want more of my brain cells focused on God. Mm -hmm. 
or God's ideas or biblical principles or, or biblical convictions. I mean, I want more of that going in. But I can't just quit my radio habit. I had to replace it with a better habit and still get a reward. Okay? So, this is my radio habit breakdown. These are all the different cues that were connected to radio and the rewards that I got by listening to the radio. And so really, in this habit loop, the only thing that changed was this. My cues were the same. My rewards were the same, but better. Right? I didn't get just not bored, and I didn't get just not distracted, or just not engaged. I actually got some better rewards. Does that help? You're breaking it down? Okay. So our takeaway today is this. Prayer is the routine for all cues. Prayer is the routine for all your cues. And it is the routine for all the cues of your friends. All the cues of your family. All the cues of your coworkers, etc., etc. Okay, are we doing good on time? Oh my goodness. So, uh, I tell you what, before we take a little break here, um, oh, sorry, let's back up here and do the questions. Before we do discussion questions, I, since we've got a little time, could we do maybe five or ten minutes of some Q&A, right, in case there's any questions from what we talked about today. And then after that, we'll take a little ten minute break and you can go over the discussion questions and get ready for church. That is... It will have an hour break. Till okay, and then we'll have an hour break before church starts. Okay. Any questions? Perfect. Okay, so let's no, have... No, oh, sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, bad habits are very easy to start and very hard to quit. I, I actually, I'm now I'm remembering how I thought of it originally. So they're very easy in the beginning, but hard in the end. And good habits are hard in the beginning, but get easier later on. Does that make sense? They're kind of inverse. It's kind of bizarre. It's amazing. Yes. Oh, please could you explain the four eight? I don't know. I assume they got it here, but oh, the, the yes. Philippians eight four and four eight. Oh, well, wow. Philippians four um, eight and then the eight four. How many here are going to be here for church? Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share a secret with you. Okay, don't tell anybody. It's a church today. Okay? But what uh, I was going to talk about this a little bit in the message today. But what we started doing in our ministry when we were going over this sort of 4-8 focus for several weeks is we actually started turning 4-8 into a verb. Okay, we started kind of applying it in different ways and different situations. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that we did was we started kind of having this exercise in all of our small groups of coming together and trying to identify what are some good 4-8 thoughts. So in other words, when Paul goes through that list, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, if anything, uh, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Well, we decided to really take that seriously. Let's think about such things. So, okay, what is something noble? And then we would actually try to come up with an idea or a statement, right, that would really kind of fall into that category of noble, right? It could be about myself. It could be about someone in my life. But the idea is, is to take Philippians 4.8 and really... Just do what Paul is saying. <laughs> really fathom each word, and each and each word is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I, I um, well, I, I just think Americans, especially, and even our ministry, had an issue when we uh, started this book. Some people were a little critical, and they th they said, "Well, David, you're you're just trying to bring positive thinking into the church." <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
brother, you shouldn't have said that. <laughs> so anyway, that, that got a little on my nerves, but I, I just, I got a little angry, and then I started dealing with it. Right. It was a cue. It, it was a cue, <laughs> but I chose a safe routine, and I started having conversations. But the point is, when you look at that list, I'm sorry that a majority of those words are not really associated with happy. When a person gives their life in the service of their country, maybe, I'm sorry, but that's noble. That's not happy. Okay? When, when someone, you know, sacrifices time to come to church like 30 or 40 minutes earlier to be kind of inconvenienced and, and put things together or put chairs up or do that kind of thing, I'm sorry, but that's not happy. That's admirable. So, I mean, we got to be careful because sometimes we can look at really great verses in the Bible and just out of a little bit of a critical nature, we're not going to get what God is really trying to give us in that verse. So that's the point of that exercise is to really sort of even, you could do it individually or you could do it, We I really enjoy doing it in a small group of just really coming together and thinking, okay, what are some really cool thoughts about God, about me, about church, about my family, or anything that would be a very helpful, healthy thought for me. Whether it's admirable, or praiseworthy, or excellent, or something like that. Does that help? Okay. Very good. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that um, sinful habits can lead you to your legitimate need or rewards a lot quicker right. as opposed to righteous habits which take time. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I, th um, I, I first got that idea um, or that understanding I think from working with addicts which is just one form of sin. Yeah. But to understand that I, I do believe we don't sin because it doesn't work. We sin because it works but we just fail to understand that the reward that I'm getting for this, I'm acquiring it in a very unhealthy way. So probably the best example I can give, my own personal issue was for, for a few years, was pornography. And that was sort of the beginning of my a really dark time in my Christian life was when pornography was coming back. But I had to start asking myself, not just to stop a sin, you know, and cut that out, but I had to figure out, okay, why do I go that? What are, what are the cues that lead up to that? And what are the rewards that I'm gaining from that? Some of that reward was, you know, a sense of control, uh, excitement, thrill. Again, there is no law against, right, thrill or excitement. Excitement can be a wonderful, great thing. But how I choose to get to excitement is a very... That's the, that's the question. So I think with any sin, whether it's sexual or even mental sin, like how we think about people or judge people, those kinds of sins, I think we really have to think a little bit deeper and ask a little bit more, okay, what, what's the ultimate reward that's going on there? Like when I, when I gossip or, or when I yell at my kid, what, what, what's the reward there? You know, is it a sense of control? Oh, maybe I feel control, right? When I yell at my kids, they pay attention pretty quickly, and man, we're out the door. Well, be careful there, because that might work, and I might get this really interesting reward, but i got to think a little differently. What's a different routine that can get my kids out of the house, right? And I can still have that sense of control. I'm under control. I'm managing my home. Yeah. But what's a better routine to get to that reward? Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think one of the interesting things you just brought up in the last session, and it was about the radio. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm definitely a current terrorist, uh -huh. and naturally I listen to a tremendous amount of stuff that's going on in Birmingham, mm -hmm. and also across uh, the world. Sure. And one of the things I, I, I find is that it constantly comes up conflict in how God loves us and how we need to love people as well. Right. And that's, uh, you know, in this context, what we're talking about, you know, this transformation that it's actually forcing you to go through, you know, it's, it's hard. Yeah. But it's something that we need to 
really really take a role to understand and to love a neighbor no matter who, no matter where, right. no matter why. Yeah. It's that sort of thing. It's very hard. Right. Do you know? That's, uh, I, I think that's true. And, and you know, it goes back to the original definition that we studied today about mindfulness, right? When you are paying intentional, accepting, non-judgmental focus of your attention, okay? So again, I now my problem really was that a lot of my radio stuff was just very passive. You know, it's what habits do. You just start doing it automatically. But I think, yeah, now I would say now I'm probably more able to maybe even listen to the news, but now out of, instead of it just being kind of this numb, you know, a lot of anxious stuff, there is a way of listening to it maybe with compassion. You know, I mean, golly, I mean, we, we live in an age where, I mean, I can be aware of horrible things on every end of the planet within like two minutes. That's amazing. I mean, I don't know if human brains have ever been exposed yeah. Yeah. to that degree, yeah. that quickly, yeah. of information, right? Mm -hmm. So the question again is, okay, how do I go into that? I mean, do I go into it with, you know what, if I'm going to listen to the news, I'm not going to do it for amusement, I'm not going to do it just to kind of, you know, escape, but maybe I could go toward it with, gosh, compassion. Yeah. Wow, I mean, you know, and that might be a, an interesting motivator to move towards some kind of action, you know, like maybe sponsoring, you know, uh, some people in the situation or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, very good point. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick question. Yes. I noticed you've got some resources outlined here. Yes. You mentioned, it sounded like you, you'd compiled a book for Ray. Do you have any additional resources that you have written? Or uh, I've not written any, but uh, can I look at the list real quick? Now, the book, now I'll just share with you this. Um, so on the back here, in Appendix B, the, um, now one book that many of our small groups actually went through together, where we were all doing these together, was uh, this book right in the middle there called The 40 Days to a Joy-Filled Life. It's actually a follow-up to the first book there, The 4-8 Principle. And it's really sort of a daily devotional book with, um, yeah, he basically just kind of takes the principle of 4-8 and applies it to many, many different areas of your life. But really what he's teaching is how to be a good manager of your thought. You know, it's really, really the exercises in it, I find, uh, for those that are familiar with psychology terms, um, I would say probably mo most of his material is very based on cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, the research just can't, you can't deny it is a very effective way of, of treating many, many different disorders. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of his, it's interesting, what's great about it is that he takes a lot of those principles of CBT, but then integrates it with biblical principles and scriptures and just a, an, an acknowledgement of, this is all about God. Mm -hmm. It's really... I found it a very uh, comforting book, uh, but that uh, those are I always kind of these are kind of my favorites. These are ones that have really sort of meant the most or spoken to me the most. Uh, the last book on that top section called "See Is Believing" by Gregory Boyd. Uh, he's actually a pastor and a counselor, and uh, that was the first time that I'd ever read anything about imaginative prayer. And oh my gosh, when I read that and did some of the exercises in that book, it was remarkable to understand just, I mean, I felt like my prayer life had been in first gear all my Christian life until I read that book. And I'm like, wow, you can get in fifth. This is really cool. But I mean, he does all these interesting exercises with people where, um, now I, I would recommend this, recommend this with some caution. But, you know, he would take people that had been through some really difficult things in their lives, maybe borderline trauma-like events, and he would actually kind of guide them through a, like a praying exercise. In fact, I had a, a therapist do this with me about three years ago, and it was amazing, where you, I went back to a very painful situation that happened to me when I was about seven, 
and yet we went, we kind of prayed through that situation, described it, talked about what was going on, where was I, where was this other person, and all these things. And then you sort of imagine Jesus in that scenario. And then you imagine, okay, what does Jesus say to you in this moment? And I mean, oh my gosh, I, uh, I cried like a baby, but I mean, I got out of that, I was thinking, here's a memory that has had nothing but pain, and now it's like, it's it's a it's a different memory. It's not this. It's not just pain. It's like, wow! I feel healed. I feel considered. I feel loved. I feel cared for. Because you know, I would sit there and I would kind of imagine, what would Jesus say to me right after that happened? You know, I mean, I, I mean, I just think God has given us such an incredible imagination. If we don't use it for good, yeah. we will use it for something else. Yes. So yes. why not this? Yes. Let's let's experiment a little bit. So, thank, you. Thank, thank you. Great, great question. Yes. Yeah, so with all, with all this, then, would you say that what you think you become? Would that be true or not true? Would you agree? With oh, that? that statement. What you think, think you, you become? become. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of truth in that statement, um, but I think you know. I think the only reaction to that statement sometimes is it does sound awfully humanistic. <laughs> and that's where I think what I think I become could be true, but I also want to be careful that there's a connection there with God as well, that I'm also becoming what God wants me to become. So I think it's integrating it a little bit, right? I, I, I totally believe in that principle. I think the way that I think does strongly influence the lens through which I see my world, right? And it will determine a lot of the decisions that I'm I make. I'm thinking of what you just said, what you feed into your mind. What you feed in there is then you think about it, then you become perhaps the negative rather than the positive. There you go. And you end up being the product of. Right. Well, I like, that's what Jesus taught about the eye, right? Yeah. If your eye is pure, <laughs> but if it's dark, I mean, then we're in a whole bunch of trouble. I mean, I think that's sort of that principle, too. Like, I mean, to be more thoughtful of what is going in and, and, and considering what is the effect of that. And obviously, that affects everything, especially media. These days, I mean, um, our church staff just went through a uh, an online communication seminar uh, for churches, and this guy made a very interesting point. He said, "We live in an era unlike any other before. This is the video generation." Mm -hmm. And he gave some alarming stat, like you know, a billion videos are clicked <clears throat> on YouTube every second. That's a lot of videos. And then the next question was, what is your church contributing to that? D does your church have a, you know, something to offer out there? Because, you know, you know, I saw somebody, I had this conversation yesterday with somebody, you know, 25 years ago when I was church shopping, right, that was really hard work because you had to get up, <laughs> you know, drive across town really early in the morning, you know, go to these different churches. But these days, that's not how people look for churches. They can do that all in the comfort of their own little chair there. But, you know, and in, in, in actually in L.A., we've actually had a couple of um, really remarkable stories where people found the church through the Internet, and that's how they showed up. And Amen. God works in mysterious and digital ways. <laughs> awesome. All right, yes. Um, you were talking earlier about listening, like in terms of the cues and the reward, listening to gossip. Um, and I just wondered, have you got any suggestions? I, I work in quite an, an environment where mm -hmm. people are quite, uh, there's very low morale. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, there's a lot of gossip. Mm -hmm. And so for me, even if I don't want to be involved, I, I struggle to know how to either withdraw or not necessarily say, you know, could we stop this conversation mm -hmm. without coming across judgmental or critical or. Right. Or whatever. So I was just wondering, are there any suggestions? Uh, first of all, that sounds like a tough situation. But did you notice what she said? Yeah. And, and this is a question of the whole egg versus chicken, right? So what came first? The low morale or the gossip? I do not know. Well, you know, and, and probably both now. You'll never figure it out. But I think maybe... Um, you know, I think there's a way to articulate boundaries in a really healthy way, but I think what's interesting about boundaries is especially with people that aren't familiar with boundaries, when you first practice them, 
people tend to dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay? Like when you make a statement, hey, you know what? I'd rather, I'd rather not discuss, you know, the other people in the office. I'd rather talk about things that, you know, are going on between you and me. I mean, really, get, talk to the people there with you, right? But, you know, when you set a boundary like that that kind of seems, you know, warm and fuzzy and not too hurtful, I mean, even that one can go, well, what's your problem? So I think you always kind of have to anticipate that a little bit. But the other thing is, I would also encourage a 4-8 approach, which is, you know, and this may be hard, but, you know, just as they are free and capable of gossiping very easily, you can also utter things in any conversation about something good. Yeah. Maybe we'll call that good gossip. <laughs> I don't know. But like, for example, I, I had that same dilemma in my office where I'm in a, I was in a department with about 12 therapists. And believe me, therapists. <laughs> They're not always the healthiest people. <laughs> I mean, you think they gave all their help to other people and then didn't leave any for themselves. It was really sad. But, but anyway, so the morale in our office was often very hard. And of course, we're working in a very demanding field. I mean, chemical recovery it goes up and then it goes really down a lot. So what I noticed was that I would be in a conversation where there's gossip going on and then I'm just scrambling like, okay, what is something good I can talk about here? You know, I'd have to really work at it, but then I would just, God would always sort of ultimately give me an option. Like, oh, by the way, can I just, can I just add one thing here? I was working with so-and-so the other day. And man, when she started the group, she asked this awesome question. I mean, we need to be a light to the world. Yeah. Yeah. And if we ain't, people are not going to see things, yeah. right? Because in that low morale, gossip-filled office of yours, right, I guarantee you somehow, somewhere, there's something good probably going on somewhere. So, I hope that helps. Okay. All right, uh, that is it for now. So please uh, take your time to go over the questions here. You have been an amazing, amazing group to work with today. Thank you so much. Give yourselves a hand.